If you have your Bibles this afternoon, I invite you to join me in Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, often referred to as the Hall of Faith. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin this afternoon our message with the first 10 verses. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord, for the Holy Ghost. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glory to the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I don't know if you're out there feeling what I'm feeling in here, but my God have mercy. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 10 this afternoon. And the King James text today reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out unto a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hallelujah. Want to talk to us today on the topic the key to victory. Amen. The key to victory. If you'll bow your heads with me just one more moment this afternoon. Master, Savior, soon coming King, once again, Lord, we humble ourselves in your presence. We come before you, O oh God, needs in hand. But the need we have at this hour is to receive a word from God. If ever there's been a time in the history of the faith for the word of God to come forth unto the people of God, now is the time. 
we must hear from heaven. We must receive from God. We must today not hear the words, the thoughts, the opinions, the doctrines or dogmas of men, but we need a word from the Lord. Master, today send down the Holy Ghost like rain. Touch every heart of every hearer under the sound of my voice. Let their spirit today be tenderized. Let it be open to receiving that which you would speak unto the church through your messenger at this hour. And allow me, O oh God, to be a faithful messenger. Lord, that I might deliver unto the people of God that which you have delivered unto me, and that it might be done in a manner that is pleasing in your sight, and Lord, in a manner that will cause faith and hope and encouragement to spring up in the heart of the hearer. We ask all this today in none other than Jesus sacred, wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. The key to victory today. Too many believers lose their faith or abandon their walk with the Lord because of occasional slips or falls. They become so discouraged by their failures that they determined they just can't make it all the way to the finish line. But the Word of God today shows us that the Lord does not focus on our moment-to-moment -moment circumstance, but rather on the bigger picture. Many examples of lives viewed by the Lord in the focus of the bigger picture can be found in Hebrews 11, the Hall of Fame, or as it is more frequently called, the Hall of Faith. This is where all the big heroes of the faith are spoken of and their great accomplishments which were brought about by faith are articulated. And yet... Abraham had a child with Sarah's handmaiden while waiting on the promise of God for a son. Moses disobeyed the Lord and struck the rock rather than speak to it as he had been instructed. For this the Lord did not allow Moses to enter the promised land, although he was allowed to see it. David was full of faults and laden with sins, even going so far as to send a man to the front lines of battle so that he might be killed, all because David wanted that man's wife. Yet David is described by the Lord in the Word of God as a man after mine own heart. Each of the individuals listed in the biblical hall of faith recorded in Hebrews 11 was faulty and experienced any number of major failings or sins. Yet their names still appear in this marvelous biblical record. This chapter of God's Word focuses on their victories, not their faults, not their failings, not their sin. Their faith in the end is what stood out about them and not their weakness, not their fault, not their sin. Friend, I'm here to tell you today, there is no shame in falling. There is no shame in allowing today's, excuse me, there is only shame in allowing today's failure to stop us dead in our tracks and to prevent us from rising up from the ground, dusting off our clothes, and running on. Hallelujah. 
Remember, the Lord has already run the race and he has won on our behalf. And now all he asks of us is that we finish. Walking, running, limping, <laughs> crawling, all he desires is that we cross the finish line. Hallelujah. That's all he asks. Doesn't matter. He didn't say you've got to cross it running. He didn't say you've got to cross it walking. He didn't say you've got to cross it on your feet. No, you can crawl across that line if you have to. All he asks for is keep going till you cross the finish line. Hold on to this faith till Jesus comes. Hold on to this faith till you are lowered into the grave, one or the other. If you'll do that, then honey, you've won already. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It doesn't matter how many times you falter. It doesn't matter how many times you sin or fail God at some level or another. Listen, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Children, I want to tell you today, we can either bask in our sin and our failings, our weaknesses, allowing their weight to hold us back and prevent us from continuing forward. Or we can lay aside the weight and the sin which seeks to drive us off course and continue our journey of faith. Hallelujah. I remember years ago when I was in my ministerial internship program, in the church of God. I was serving a church in Connecticut. And it was hard. I mean, that program was tough. They say that it is two years of Bible college shoved into less than a year. You've got to read all these books. You've got to read through your Bible in like seven months. You've got all these requirements, you know. And then you've got to do everything your pastor that you're serving under asks you to do. If he asks you to teach Sunday school, you teach Sunday school. If he asks you to do children's church, you do children's church. My pastor, Brother Carver, bless his heart, he used me in all kinds of areas. For a while, he had me doing the children's church and helping to establish the children's church program once we got some folks in there that knew what they were doing and I got them trained and they took over and then next thing I know Brother Carver comes to me and he said Chuck we got a teenage uh, Sunday school class and sister I, I can't quite remember her last name but this lady's trying to teach it and boy she's having a hard time these kids are very unruly they were teenagers you know they weren't really interested in being in Sunday school mom and dad you know dragged them to church every Sunday they didn't want to be in Sunday school he said I'm going to have you go in and I'm going to have you take this class over for a while he said, and you help sister so-and-so. He said, you're going to be teaching. She's just going to sit and watch. He said, but let's see how you do with these kids. So I go into this class, and I just followed the direction that I felt God gave me. And I said, okay, folks, here's how Sunday school is going to work. I said, it's called Sunday school. 
Say, so I've never been to a school but that you take a test on the material that you've studied. I said, well, now listen. Every Sunday, we're going to start Sunday school by taking a little test, and it's going to ask us questions about what we studied last week. I said, and anybody who doesn't get a satisfactory grade on their test, I said, I'm going to go with that test and talk to mom and dad about it. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I had the most attentive bunch of kids from week one. Sister Viti, I think her name was Viti, like V-I-T-I or something. It was an Italian name, actually. She told me later, she said, Brother Chuck said, my God Almighty, said, you came in that class. She said, you literally straightened it out in the first Sunday. She said, I couldn't believe my eyes. She said, you would not believe how unruly they were for me. I could not get them to sit and listen and act right. She said, you came in, you said what you said. She said, and boom, immediately they were in order. I said, Sister Vidi, honey, when you're teaching Sunday school, when you're teaching children's church, when you're in a position like this, you need to be asking the Lord, Lord, how can I be effective? What must I do in order to fix this situation? I said, believe me, if you'll go and ask Him, He'll tell you. He told me what to do. I said, I didn't go in. That wasn't my idea. I said, that was God's idea. That's what the Lord laid on my heart to do. Let me tell you something. Those kids, within a month, those kids were thoroughly enjoying Sunday school. I kid you not. All of a sudden, we had young people in the church going down to the altar at altar service time, going down to pray, going down to be prayed for. Uh, the pastor said, Good Lord Almighty, Chuck. He said, What on earth did you do in that class? Couldn't believe what had happened. I want to tell you today, my friend, that program was hard. I'm doing all this stuff, plus I'm doing all the studying and all that. And man, if we had a prayer meeting, I had to be at the prayer meeting. Oh, and did I mention that I was still working full time because I had a car payment to make? And that program was so stressful, it was so difficult. There were a lot of times that I didn't get everything done that I needed to get done. And I remember one day there was a church that we had to, that uh, anyone in the program, the internship program, we had to go to Brother Flynn's church once a month and we had to take tests on the material we were reading and all that. And Brother Flynn was one of the most amazing Church of God preachers I've ever met in my life. The man knew the Word of God like it was going out of style. You could literally just tell him a verse and he could quote it. I swear that man had the entire Bible memorized. I really do believe that. Absolutely brilliant man. Brilliant man. And I loved the opportunities I had to be around him, you know, and talk to him because he was brilliant. Brother Flynn, one day I went to Brother Flynn and I went there for my test and I was telling him how much struggle I was having with this program and getting through it and doing everything I needed to do. And I said, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can make it. And Brother Flynn said this to me. If thou faint in the day of adversity, Thy strength is small. It's Proverbs 24 and verse 10. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. All of a sudden, Tommy, I realized that a lot of people in the church love to brag about what a great Christian they are. They love to brag about how strong they are in the faith and how strong their faith is, right? But then some circumstance comes along, some situation comes along. Next thing you know, they're backslidden out of church. They're no longer serving the Lord. And I remember what Brother Flynn said to me. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength 
is small. When things get tough, if you can't handle it, then maybe the strength you think you've got, you don't have. Hello now. According to the Word of God, if you faint, when things get tough, then your strength is small. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye might, excuse me, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. There's only one prize in the race. Jesus has already won the prize. So if you're running to get the crown, then honey, uh, you're on a fool's errand because the, the winner's already crossed the finish line. And there are too many Christians who are running this race, Tommy, as though they are trying to win. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to be as perfect as Jesus. Well, it ain't never going to happen, so you're on a fool's errand. But if you'll run this race to finish, which is what God's asked you to do, He said, if you finish the race, I'll share my victory with you. Hallelujah. All you got to do is finish. What's the key to victory? Oh, it's easy. Finish the race. That's it. Just finish. Doesn't matter how much of a beating you take. Doesn't matter how many times you have to stop and catch your breath. Doesn't matter how many times you fall down and you have to get up again, brush yourself off and keep running. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It doesn't matter how many times you slip. It doesn't matter how many times you sin. Or give in to weakness. Just get up again and keep going because all God's asked you to do is finish. And if you'll finish, you too will be declared the victor. That's why we sing <coughs> Victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. My Savior forever. He sought me, He bought me with His redeeming blood. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. All we got to do is finish. And the Lord said, and you know what? Every one of you that finishes are going to stand there with me. Glory. Oh, they're going to stand there with me when I get the crown. And you too will be a winner. Every one. Oh, hallelujah to God. Too many believers have become convinced that Jesus Christ came into our world so that the unbeliever might be condemned and punished. But that is the opposite of the truth. He did not come to condemn, but He came to save. If we focus on and remember always this truth, we can hold fast to our hope in Christ and rest assured in His salvation. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world. That's not the purpose in the Lord's coming. But that the world through Him might be saved. The promise of God's Word is not that we shall be condemned at the slightest provocation, but rather at the slightest acknowledgement of our wrongdoing, the Lord our God has promised to forgive, forget, and forge forth.
forward. 1 John 1, 8 and 9, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My goodness, God has made it so easy. He's made it so easy. He said, honey, listen, if you want to get up, brush off, and keep moving, all you got to do is say, Lord, forgive me. I really messed up. And the Lord said, I'll forgive you. It's done. It's finished. That's over. We're not going to look at that again. We're not going to talk about that again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. In Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, there is therefore now no condemnation, none, to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. How many Christians just don't get this? They're constantly trying to satisfy the law of sin and death. But the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You keep trying to follow the rules. You keep trying to live some certain standard in order to achieve salvation. And the Lord says, Honey, the law that I established at Calvary made that law moot. That law doesn't stand anymore. So you're trying to satisfy something that don't even apply. It doesn't have nothing to do with today. Hello now. For what the law could not do, what the law could not do, could not do, could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, meaning who are not trying to satisfy the law, but after the Spirit. Walking after the Spirit is not walking in sinless perfection. It is walking, listen to me children, it is walking on a spiritual path that takes God at His word and trusts His every promise. When we say we're walking after the Spirit, that means we're on a spiritual journey. We're on a spiritual mission. And that journey and that mission involves our trusting God and taking every promise at His Word. Hallelujah. That's what walking after the Spirit means. So when it says who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. It's not talking about people who somehow or another are walking perfect lives and doing everything perfect, doing everything right. No, 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 no. It's talking about people who are trusting God and who are believing His promises and trusting that God's going to keep His Word. The Lord said, if I finish, I'm going to make it. So glory to God, I'm going to finish. It's that easy. He said, if I sin and I confess my sin, that He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm trusting God. I'm taking Him at His word. I'm believing that He does what He says He will do. Rejoice today, children of God. The Lord is with you. He is for you. He is rooting you onward and forward. There is no desire in His heart to see you fail. He has made the journey for us as easy as possible. He has taken the penalty 
take for sin upon himself so that he might remove that penalty for us from the equation. That penalty is not even in the equation at this point. Why? Because we believed it. We've trusted it. We take him at his word. The Master beckons you onward. He beckons you onward today with these words of encouragement. Focus on the bigger picture. What is the key to victory today? It's simple. Focus on the bigger picture. All the saints from the Old Testament, all the New Testament saints we read about, Peter and Paul and James and John, there's not a one of them that the Word of God does not articulate for us some failing they had or some weakness they had or some area, some example of their failing and doing something foolish. Peter! Good Lord, Peter, bless his heart, he was constantly falling down, uh, tripping on his tongue and saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. Am I telling the truth? Yet the Lord looks at Peter and said, Peter, Satan hath desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, hallelujah, strengthen the brethren. Isn't it funny? The Lord wasn't condemning Peter for the fact he was going to deny him. The Lord never condemned Peter for the fact that he was going to fail him. No. He said, and when you've returned, Strengthen the brethren. He knew this guy has got more faults and he's got more weaknesses in his life than he knows what to do with. But thank God he's got one strength. Every time he falls, he gets up and keeps running. Hallelujah! And isn't it funny when we read about Peter? Not one time in the Word of God does Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, any of the New Testament writers, Jude, none of them, talk about Peter's failures. None of them talk about the times Peter fell, the times Peter did something stupid. None of them talk about the times that any of their fellow brethren fell. Isn't it interesting? You know why? Because God is focused on the bigger picture. God don't get his uptight about incidents and situations and circumstances as we do. Every time we experience a circumstance, we think the world stops, God focuses on it, and now, oh boy, I'm going to split hell wide open because I failed the Lord. I tripped, I fell. Oh my Lord, have mercy. And what you don't understand is God hadn't got time to be focusing on your falling and on your failure. He's not looking for you to fall. That's not where He gleans His joy. That's not where God gets His pleasure from watching us fall. No, what makes Him happy is when we fall and we dust ourselves off and we get up and we keep running. That's what makes the Lord happy. Honey, He's cheering you on. He is not looking to condemn you. He's not looking to criticize you. He's not looking to send you to a devil's hell. No. Once you believed and obeyed this gospel, sweetheart, God's on your side from that day through eternity. The Lord's saying, hey, look at the bigger picture. Look at the hall of faith. In Hebrews 11, every one of those people, I could go down the list and I could point out some sinful, terrible things they did. Every one of them. But isn't it funny how the Holy Ghost inspired the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews? Isn't it funny how the Holy Ghost simply inspired Paul to speak of their achievements in relation to their faith? Nowhere is there a book of failings. Nowhere is there a book of failure. Nowhere is there a book of sin where God talks about how this one did this and that one did that and this one failed here and that one failed there. No, because God is focused on the bigger picture. The bigger picture is not about all the details. The bigger picture is you started this race, are you going to finish that's the bigger picture. That's it right there. Everything in between, God could care less about. 
<laughs> Everything between start and finish, the Lord can care less about. Just so long as you can keep the faith you found at your conversion, and you can keep that faith until you reach the finish line. Hallelujah. Oh, you may fall. You may fail. You may sin. You may do some foolish things, say some foolish things along the way. But God is focused on the bigger picture. But He finished. Hallelujah. He didn't let any of that stop Him. He finished. She finished. They finished. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. What is the key to victory today? In a nutshell, focus on the bigger picture. Hallelujah.